if you follow the poker world even a little bit, then you've heard by now about Mike Postle, the man who allegedly cheated poker players on live stream out of a quarter of a million dollars over the last couple years. In this video, we're going to break down the lawsuit that's been filed against him and try to unravel it a little bit so that we can understand what's going on. Now, for those of you who don't know who I am, first off, welcome to the channel. My name is Scott. I'm a poker player, a poker vlogger, and I'm also a, an attorney. Not currently practicing, perhaps again someday, but I have several years of experience specifically in litigation, which means suing people and defending people who have been sued. So I feel like I'm pretty qualified to talk about this specific issue. On top of that, I've also played with Mike Postle, played with him once on stream, lost a big pot to him, probably going to go over that in a future video. So if you want to watch that and get my thoughts about what it was like playing with him, definitely subscribe. But all in all, I feel like I have some very relevant experience here and I'd like to kind of give back to the poker community and help shed some light on what's going on here. So for those of you who don't know, one week ago, plaintiffs in this lawsuit filed their complaint. And the complaint is really a document that starts a civil action. It's where you tell the court and you tell the defendants, whoever you're suing, hey, we're starting an official action against you. Here's what we're claiming and here are the damages that we're trying to recover. So in this video, I think I really wanna do three things. I wanna go kind of briefly through the claims themselves and see well, what are plaintiffs claiming and what are they trying to get in terms of damages? Secondly, I want to talk about what I think are going to be some of the more interesting issues in this case. And third, I'm just going to try and make some predictions and really just try to give you guys an idea of what you should expect uh, to get out of this lawsuit and kind of a timeline of when to expect it. Now, I'll drop a link to the complaint down below in the description. And if you really want to have a good understanding of what's going on here, you should just read it yourself. It's 34 pages, but it's double spaced. There's a lot of white space. And if you're familiar at all with kind of the Mike Postle story already, it's going to be a very quick read. So I recommend you just read it yourself or follow along in this video. And I'll try to put up the pertinent, uh, pertinent passages kind of as I talk about them throughout the video. So without further ado, let's get started. So the first thing that we want to understand about this lawsuit is that it's not a criminal prosecution. These are claims being brought by private individuals who claim that they've been cheated. So no matter what happens with this lawsuit, Mike Postle's not going to go to jail. In order for that to happen, there'd have to be an action brought by the government. Uh, and as far as I know, no such action has been started yet, although my suspicion and my hope is that there are uh, some investigations going on. So. If you're, if you're just concerned about, hey, is this guy going to jail? Well, not from this action. This lawsuit is all about this group of plaintiffs trying to get their money back from what they feel they've been cheated. So if we look at the first couple pages, we can learn a lot about this lawsuit. We can see who the plaintiffs are. There's a whole group of them. I think maybe 20, 25, someone there. I'm not looking at it right this instant. You'll see some familiar faces there. If you're kind of familiar with the poker world, Veronica, who busted the whole story opens on there. Jamin Burton's on there, and, you know, there's a lot of people on there, and these are all going to be people who have played with them and who are trying to get their money back that they feel they've been cheated out of. We can also see who the defendants are. These are the people that are being sued. So you have Mike Postle, you have Justin Kuritis, I hope I'm saying that name right. You have Stone's Gambling Hall, and then you also have John Doe and Jane Doe's 1 through 10. And why are they here? Who, who are these people? Well, kind of the point is that we don't know who these people are, right? So we're not sure who all was actually involved in this scandal. Was it Mike Postle acting alone? Was he a lone wolf, so to speak? Or was he aided by one accomplice or five or eight? We don't really know. So this is kind of the plaintiff's way of keeping their options open. They're telling their court, hey, we suspect there might be more people involved. We're not sure who their identity is now, but we're putting you on notice that uh, we intend to pursue discovery on this probably, and we may come back and amend the complaint, update the complaint to include the identities of these people as we learn them. Now, if you read the complaint, uh, I'll put the language up here, but it seems very likely that they're going to amend at some point to specifically name Justin Caritas as one of the accomplices. They put some language in here that basically tips this off. And uh, who else will be named? 
We'll just have to wait and see. We also can see that this action was filed in federal court. You know, this is always something that lawyers have a choice. Do I want to file in state court or federal court? There are some rules about when you can go to one and when you can go to the other. This is probably an action that could have been filed in either one. And I think there's a couple of reasons they filed it in federal court, including one of their claims is a federal claim. Uh, but that's just something that as a lawyer, you would always notice. We can also see who the lawyers for the plaintiffs are. The lead lawyer, as I understand it, is this Mac Verstandig fellow. I hope I'm saying his name right as well. So now let's kind of go into the complaint itself, where the meat of the complaint is the allegations and the claims. Uh, I'm not going to go over the allegations here. I think if you if you follow the Mike Possel situation at all, you're probably familiar with what's being alleged. And if you're not, you really should just read it yourself or go watch one of Joy Ingram's videos or something else. Uh, I'm going to try and keep it brief. And so I'll just skip right ahead to the, to the claims. Well, the claims are the heart of your complaint. The claims are telling the court, here are the laws we think they broke, and here are the damages that we think we suffered as a result, and therefore they should be forced to pay back to us. So there's eight claims brought in this lawsuit, and I think it's actually easiest if we take them in reverse order. So minor correction, there's actually nine claims, and we'll start with number nine. This is a pretty unique claim in the lawsuit. It's the only claim that's not brought by all the plaintiffs. This one's brought only by Veronica. Now, Veronica is the lady who broke this story. And when she broke it, you know, she was essentially told by Stone's Gambling Hall to kind of go pound sand. So this claim is a libel claim against Stone's Gambling Hall. And what's interesting is that they're only asking for nominal damages. Now, what are nominal damages? I think a good synonym here is uh, symbolic damages. So you would seek nominal damages when someone's wronged you and you either haven't really suffered any true damage or you can't really prove it, but you do feel like you've been wronged and you want that acknowledged. So they're asking for a thousand dollars. It's not uncommon for courts to award nominal damages, even smaller than that, even literally sometimes a single dollar just as a way of acknowledging, hey, you've been wronged and we want to formally acknowledge that by means of awarding you some amount of money. I think, you know, this is clearly the least important claim in the lawsuit in terms of the amount of money they're seeking or that they might recover. But I think it's kind of a nice thing for them to have included it because Veronica took on a tremendous amount of risk when she essentially went public with this story and she received a lot of blowback in the immediate aftermath. Now, her reputation has certainly recovered by this point. She's now pretty much universally regarded as a hero for having broken the story. But it, it wasn't clear that that's how it was going to play out. And if not for the work of some people like uh, Joey Ingram and a lot of other people who have helped investigate, you know, there's a universe, a different universe right now that you can imagine where Veronica has nobody believing her and her reputation is very damaged. And part of that is uh, would have, have to be the fault of Stone's Casino, who really didn't do a proper investigation. At least would be the plaintiff's allegations. So they're including this claim just as a way of saying, hey, we want to acknowledge that they treated her very poorly uh, and get some damages to that effect. Now, I don't want to spend so long going through all the other claims because I can already feel this video becoming longer than I wanted it to be. So I'm going to group claims eight and two all kind of into one. Now they're not. They're distinct claims that they're claims uh, under different causes of actions. They're going to have different elements. They're going to have different things that you need to prove in order to, to win. And they're going to have different damages, but I'm going to kind of treat them all as one for purposes of this discussion. So these are all claims brought by all the plaintiffs and different of the claims are brought against different subsets of the defendants. You know, Mike Postle is a defendant in most of them. One of them is a claim against Stone's Gambling Hall for essentially not putting on a more safe and uh, secure game. But all of these we can think of as being kind of claims, claims around the fact that the game was a scam, right? And, you know, there's going to be questions about whose fault was that. There's going to be questions about who has to pay for that. There's going to be questions about, you know, who was involved in the in in the scheme, certainly. But all of these claims kind of go to that central issue. So the last claim to go over, although the first claim in the actual order of the complaint, 
is this RICO claim. RICO stands for the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, although nobody calls it that. You just call it RICO. And this is a this is a law that was passed back in the 60s or 70s, really very for one specific purpose, to uh, give the government a better legal tool to go after the mafia. Historically, it's been used by government uh, against organized criminal organizations. Um, but there is, it does allow for civil claims as well. So a question that you should have, or that you may have, is, well, why, why would... Why would the plaintiffs want to bring a RICO claim here? Especially because RICO claims are notoriously hard to litigate. You have to prove a lot of things. Uh, you have to go really work hard to win on them. And it's not easy to win a civil RICO claim. So why did they include it? Because it has a provision where you can actually recover triple your damages. Meaning if, you know, if say someone, an organized crime gang stole $10 from you, you could recover $30 instead of just your 10 and there's also a provision where you can get your attorney's fees back. Now, this is not the usual case in uh, the American legal system. Usually, the winner gets damages, but they still have to pay their own attorney's fees. There are other systems, like I think the UK, the default is the other way around, where the loser generally has to pay the attorney's fees for the winner. But here we do it differently, and we kind of assume, unless there's a, a specific reason otherwise, everyone pays their own attorney's fees. Now, you can imagine that attorney's fees can get to be a lot of money. So anytime there's a law or provision in a cause of action that lets you recover attorney's fees potentially, that's very powerful. Uh, also, the triple damages can be very powerful because you can just triple whatever amount of money that you can prove you were cheated out of. Now, what's interesting about the Regal claim as it stands right now is that it's not, it doesn't include Stone's Gambling Hall. I think it's only against Mike Postle and Justin Curatis, if I recall correctly. No, it's actually against uh, Mike Postle and the John and Jane Doe's, although, as mentioned before, I fully expect Justin Curatis to be um, included in the John Doe's at some point in the future. But the, the big point here is that Stone's Gambling Hall is not uh, currently named in this claim. I expect that they also, at some point, will be wrapped up in it, especially, you know, if Justin, who is an employee of Stone's, gets named in this claim, it's going to be very easy to then uh, include Stone's gambling hall in it. I'm not saying easy to win, but you have very good ground to at least include them in the claim. There's a very well-known legal doctrine called respondeat superior, which is Latin for essentially let whoever's in charge be held resp responsible. And, you know, this is the sort of doctrine under which if you get hit by an Uber driver, you also get to sue Uber, not just the driver. Well, likewise here, if if an employee of Stone's Gambling Hall was involved in any way in a, a cheating scheme, then you're going to have a very strong legal grounds to go and uh, pursue Stone's to recover your damages there. Now, once you can roll Stone's into it, that's really important because... Let's say that Mike, let's just assume for the sake of discussion that Mike Postle did steal or cheat a quarter of a million dollars worth. Well, where is that money right now? Does he have it in a hole in his backyard? Has he spent it? Has he divvied it up against some people? Uh, who's to say? But we might not ever see it again. Even if we win the lawsuit, it might be hard for the plaintiff to get that money back. Now, if you triple it and you say we're going to try and get 750000 what are the chances that Mike Postle and whoever else can really pay that? Maybe they can, but probably they can't, right? Stone's Gambling Hall can almost certainly pay it. So being able to roll stones into these claims is going to be a major effort of the plaintiffs, I would predict, as the case goes on. So we've talked a little bit about the claims, albeit briefly. I hope it makes sense. If not, please drop a comment or a question below. And I want to talk a little bit now about what I think is going to be one of the most interesting uh, legal issues in this case, which is going to be the issue of damages. So every single claim, if, if you win on a claim, that's only half the battle, right? Let's say I prove that you cheated me. Well, now I have to prove my case about how much you cheated me or what damages I suffered. And if you look at the claims, every single one essentially ends with the same language. I'll just read it to you. It says, uh, the plaintiffs are seeking damages quote, in an amount equal to the damages suffered by each individual plaintiff. Well, what is the amount of damages that each individual plaintiff suffered here? 
if I steal $50 from you, it's very easy to say, well, my damages are $50. But how do we do it in a poker game like this? Let's say I went on stream with Mike Postle and I played one pot with him where he took $1,000 off me. Well, if that's the only pot I played all night, then we can pretty comfortably say what my damages are to $1,000. But what if I won $500 off the other players throughout the course of the session? Now, are my damages still 1000 or are my damages only 500 which is my net loss on the night? What if I won $2,000 off the other players, lost 1000 to Mike, so I'm actually up 1000 Now, do I have any damages? Do I have $1,000 damages? What do I have? What if I lost 1000 to Mike, but then after the stream, I won you know, $500, right? You can see all the permutations, and this is going to be really interesting to see how the courts deal with this. As far as I know, there's no precedent for a case like this. We've seen cases where people have sued casinos or casinos have sued people or things like where people have sued the lottery, stuff like that. But I don't think we've ever seen a case where a casino hosted game has involved cheating between two of the players, at least not on this scale, as, as far as I know. So this is going to be pretty much uh, new territory for the court, and we'll just have to wait and see how they deal with it. We might not even get an answer. It's very possible. But if we do... I'll be very interested to see what it is. I think one solution that the court might be tempted to take, you know, because judges are people, just, you know, we're, people are drawn to kind of clean cut solutions. And one solution I can see the court being drawn to, being tempted to go with here is just say, hey, let's add up all the money that Mike Possel won on the streams when he was cheating. Let's say it was a quarter of a million dollars. Plaintiffs, those are your damages and you divide it amongst yourselves however you want to. Right, something along those lines. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but I could see that being being a solution that the court uh, might be drawn to. Of course, there's about a million different other ways they could do it as well. So we'll just have to wait and see. So we've gone over the claims, we've gone over some of the legal issues here, and I want to wrap up with just what to expect and maybe make a few predictions about what's going to happen in this lawsuit. The first thing to know is that it's going to be slow, right? The wheels of justice do turn slowly. It's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason, and the reason is that it's true. If this case, case did ever get to trial, which I fully expect it not to, uh, it wouldn't get to trial for, my guess is, at least two years. Um, you know, cases are not designed to be, to be litigated quickly. There are many stages to it, and the first stage we're going to see, I think, is a motion to dismiss. That is when the defendant's well, first, we're going to see the defendants have to answer the complaint. They're going to file a document called an answer, and they're probably going to assert some counterclaims, and then the plaintiffs will have to respond to the counterclaims. And so once that happens, now we have, theoretically, although it can all be amended at some point, but now we have all the claims that both parties are making against each other. Once that happens, then I fully expect, and that could take months, right, for even just to get to this point, once that happens, there's going to be, I fully expect, some motions to dismiss filed. What a motion to dismiss is, is you go to the court and you say, hey, they've accused me of breaking this law, but even if everything they say in their complaint is true, that's still not enough to show that I've broken this law. Uh, these are very common, and I fully expect the defendants to file one, at least with regards to the RICO claim, just because that's such a powerful claim to be in the complaint that if they can get rid of it, that's a big win. Uh, that's a big win for the defendants. In actuality, I expect them to file a motion to dismiss against the entire suit, but certainly against the RICO claim. So even just this pushes us out, you know, six months, and we still haven't even really started the lawsuit. You know, if we get past that stage, then there's going to be a long discovery phase. That's when you can demand documents from your from the defendants from from your opposition. It's when you can make them answer certain questions. It's when you can take depositions. All this stuff is going to occur. So again, I just want to underline the fact that this is going to be a long, long process. Don't expect results anytime soon. Also, it's really unlikely this case goes to trial. The fact of the matter is almost no cases go to trial in general. And this case, I don't expect to be an exception to that. In fact, this case probably has some reasons why it's even less likely than average to go to trial. One of those is that, you know, Stone's going to face a lot of bad publicity if this goes to trial. They want to avoid that. Uh, for the plaintiffs, it's going to be very expensive to 
uh, just to pay the attorneys to, to litigate this case. So both sides are going to have incentive to settle here. Now, we'll see how the plaintiffs play it, right? Because, you know, the plaintiffs may kind of take a moral stance here and say, no, we want to go to trial here. Uh, you know, this is a this is a major injustice that's been done to the poker community, and we want to uh, expose this guy as a cheater. And, you know, that's their right to do that. They may very well do that, but they're also going to have, you know, probably some settlement offers coming along the way. So we'll see how that all shakes out. Uh, the last point that I really want to end on here is overall, this is a very well-written complaint. Uh, if I was writing the complaint myself, it would be very similar to this. I like that the plaintiffs really played it conservatively in the claims they made and the facts they alleged. You know, when you practice law, you see a variety of complaints and you see a lot of complaints where plaintiffs really overextend themselves and maybe make some allegations that they can't back up or it's not clear if they're going to be able to back up. Here, that's not the case. Really, everything they said is either, you know, clearly true or they have a very, very, very reasonable sound argument for why it's true. And I think that's really important in this case because one of the ongoing themes here that's going to be probably present throughout the course of this litigation is that you, the parties are going to be dealing with people who don't understand poker. You know, if you're in the poker community, if you've been playing poker for 20 years, five years even, even a couple years, it's pretty easy for us to look at what Mike Postle did and understand, you know, just how insanely unlikely it would be for him to have these results without cheating. And we can all understand that. But we have to understand that that's not the average person. And so, you know, we don't know. It's unlikely that the judge will be a poker player, right? Just statistically, how many people are poker players? If there's a jury in this case, it's unlikely that they comprise of any poker players. In fact, the defendants would probably prevent any poker players from being allowed on the jury. And so it's really important in this case for the plaintiffs to maintain their credibility throughout the course of the lawsuit, because if at any point they step outside of claims that they can really back up solidly, it's going to be so easy for the defendants to start attacking the credibility and the judge, you know, the judge or the jury or whoever the fact finder is, it's going to be really easy for them to say, well, I don't know, you know, they said that thing and they were wrong about that. So maybe this Mike Postle guy just is really good or maybe he is really lucky. So, you know, I, I took a while to make that point, but I just want to underscore that this is a very well-written complaint. It's, uh, it's, it, it's the sort of complaint that I read and it says to me that these guys ha have a plan. They know what they're doing and they kind of are aware of the challenges they're going to face because this is not going to be an easy suit for them to litigate. So I'll wrap it up there. If you have any questions or comments, again, please feel free to leave a comment below. Uh, if you want me to make more videos on this, I may do that. And maybe at like every six months, I'll make a video updating how the lawsuit's going. Or maybe I won't. I don't know. But if you want to see that, if you want that, uh, you know, like and subscribe, do all that good stuff. And um, I just also want to end off by saying a big thank you to Veronica for breaking the story. She did it, you know, at a pretty significant risk to her own reputation. She's talked a lot of um, on podcasts about how it was, you know, really scary and difficult for her, which is totally understandable. So just a big shout out to her. You know, I think she's pretty much regarded now as a hero by everybody, but uh, I don't think we can thank her enough. So big thanks to Veronica. And I'll end it there and see you guys in the next video.